Father, thank you for your presence. I ask one thing during this time, Jesus. Let it be that Dave and I remain aware of your presence the entire time. Because what, what is worth anything that doesn't come forth from your presence? So Holy Spirit, help us. Stay fixed upon your person and let the word be exactly what it's supposed to be. To stay the mind, stay the heart upon the Lord. In your precious name, amen. amen. All right. So it's Dave Papavisi and Eric Gilmore. We are looking at First John, uh, one of our favorite books in the Bible. I think Dave would agree with me in, in this statement that nobody writes like John. He is his own category. Praise God for all the other kinds of writings. They're all needed. But when you get to John, I think you hit, in my personal opinion, the highest language that there is. It's important to know a couple of things about First John. Number one, many theologians believe that this is his last go. This is his last letters, first, second, third John. Even after the book of Revelation, he's written these letters. It, it is thought that John has already served God for 60 years, 60 years faithful to God through torture. And he writes these things as his concluding thoughts after 60 years of faithfulness to the Lord and through persecution. And, and also, it's interesting to note that he had already seen the physical Christ. He was present in all the miracles. He laid his head upon his chest. But he also saw the great acts move of the Spirit firsthand. He was there in the upper room. And it's also important to notice he has already seen the decline of the churches years later. He saw the rise and he saw the decline. He saw all the different heresies that had been being injected into the body. And to me, it's just important to realize what his final concluding thoughts are. And we find them here in, in 1 John. Uh, it is also thought that he is writing these things at the age of 90 or, you know, in between 90 to 95 years old. That's crazy. We're listening to the distilled thoughts of a 90-year-old faithful man of God who is arguably the closest person to Christ that ever walked on the earth. It, it, arguably, but in my personal opinion, I would say yes. But uh, what do you think, Dave? Some overall thoughts. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's believed that John was writing to a church, like you mentioned, um, some of which had fallen away and those that were remaining he was writing them to in, to encourage them pointing to the christ and to the foundations um of 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 kingdom and there's a couple of words that come up uh consistently actually three words at least in the english language that start with the letter l <laughs> and those are light life and love um it seems that he, he kind of focuses in on those themes, the person of Christ and as expressed through the picture of light and then life and love. Um, one of the things that I know he was addressing through his writings is the, the false teaching that was, had infected the church to some degree of Gnosticism, which for those that are listening and don't know uh, what that teaching is, and maybe you want to touch on this too, is found, foundationally it was that all matter was evil and that all spirit was good and that the solution to that problem or to that uh, tension was knowledge or gnosis, the Greek word or secret knowledge, I guess, I guess we could say uh, so that the, mankind could be lifted out from this evil world of matter. But this led to two train of, trains of thought, uh, one of which was that Christ himself in the flesh was a, like a type of a ghost. He, he was never truly fully one in identifying with us in our humanity. He is not the God man fully like we would understand a human being to be, but more uh, a ghost or a spirit. And then the second was the fact, and of course, this is the way that it plays out, was a lax approach to what we do with the body. Because if all matter is evil and is of this, you know, lower world, then these are just things that we use and that are passing. Um, and so even in his writings, he's addressing this, this way of thinking 
that we will see, you know, in the text. All right. So what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, uh, though I believe he is talking directly to Gnosticism, showing that Jesus is physical. He actually was here. He wasn't a ghost, a vapor. He, he, I also believe there's a mystical element to it where we have heard Christ in the gospel and we have seen the gospel work and that has caused us to turn our attention to look at the Lord and touch him, reach out and touch him so that we have an experience of the word of life through hearing the gospel, seeing it work, and then choosing to look at the Lord and reach out and touch him. It's almost like when you wake up in the morning, because you've heard the gospel and you've seen it work in your life, you now have the ability to look at the Lord and reach out and have a direct contact with him who is this life life supply so on the one hand though it is i believe directly addressing gnosticism jesus is real but i think that there there's a present application to it in our experience that now we can look at him now we can touch him what do you think yeah yeah i think i think the two are fully true uh, on the one hand he's making a statement right he's addressing the false teaching jesus is real and not only is he real but he is wanting to be experienced through every human sense, if we could say, that, that, that God has given to, to man. You know, like we are called to experience him, to receive him, to see him, to touch him, to taste of him. Everything about the way even that we are created is for the purpose of encountering the risen Lord and primarily for the way that we relate to God. We are created primarily with everything about our faculties in, in, in by, by divine design and in, in how we relate to the Lord. And then everything else comes afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Cause he is naming every sense there pretty much hearing, seeing, touching. He's he, Jesus is a reality. The life was manifested. My goodness. What words, the life that God is, was made revealed, manifested. And we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and manifested to us. What are your thoughts? Yeah, like you mentioned, it's very, very similar to John chapter one in his gospel. Um, God becomes man and he tabernacles amongst men. Um, it's interesting to me that he... he so even his encounter with the Lord, he says, concerning the word of life. And that life was revealed, was made manifest. Mm -hmm. So even the way he, in, in, in John 1, the gospel of John chapter 1, he says, the word was in the beginning. The word was with God. The word was God. And the mm -hmm. word put on flesh and was tabernacled amongst men. So even the same, he's, he's taking the same imagery, the word of life, the communication of the person of God was revealed. Jesus is God's communication to the world in bodily form. Wow. And revelation, communication, revelation, and in a sense, impartation, right? Sure. He's communicating him that reveals him. And when that happens, we receive him uh, through the same means. Uh, he goes on here, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. And I love this. This is my favorite part of the entire chapter. All that he said, he says, so that you too may have fellowship with us. <laughs> Bro, it's like he's saying the whole purpose of my writing is that you would experience what I'm experiencing. My right. fellowship with the Father and the Son, my experiential exchange with him that has kept me all these years, this revelation of him that I have by personal experience, I am telling you these things because, so that you too, for this reason, that you too would have that fellowship with God. I, I, I really feel in my own personal life a burning desire to see people enter into a blissful, life-empowering life-changing transformative experience with God every single day to live by it. And I feel right here that there's a scriptural basis for exactly that. John is saying, I'm writing. So this, so this will happen that you would have this experience of Jesus and live by it. 
Yeah. And the, and the product of his encounter <laughs> with, with the Lord is this him reaching out to another compelled to pull him into the same experience, <laughs> which we, which we see in, the, in uh, the rest of the book, when he starts to talk about love, he's talked about life um, and he's going to, he's going to, in this next section, talk about light, mm-hmm. but it's, it's all inspired and motivated by love because in his encounter with God, it provokes him to bring others into that same fellowship and experience. And he says, we are writing these things to you so that our joy may be complete mm-hmm. or as some variations say your joy may be ultimately, I believe it's I'm speaking of both, of both ends so that joy would find its end goal. We write these things so that joy can come into full consummation. The joy of the Godhead rejoicing over the fact that their creation, that the creation is finding its true purpose and identity in fellowship with him, loving fellowship with him. There is joy in the Godhead that spills over into our fellowship with him. But it's interesting. He's motivated. He's, he says, I'm writing these things to you for the sake of the fulfillment of joy. And it's interesting because we live in a day and age now, like it's, there's, there's so much, you know, anxiety in the world. Yeah. So much fear that gets pushed through, through the news and the media, uh, you know, the legalizing of marijuana, people staying under this, you know, constantly living under, you know, the influence of some drug popping some pill just to try to have the anxiety leave the Mm. fear, leave the depression, leave so that they may have joy. Right. I mean, people working 70, 80 hours a week just so that they can get enough money to be able to buy that, whatever it may be, or to impress whoever that may be so that they may find joy. Joy is made complete. Mm. The human heart, you know, is, is restless until it finds rest in God, as Augustine says. Joy is found in fellowship. Right. It's, it's, what, it's what we want. Joy is found in fellowship. Absolutely. We've, there's a divine inclusion to, to the Trinitarian complacency or, or, or satisfaction that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit find in each other a satisfaction. And through Christ, God has reached down and grabbed humanity and included them in the satisfying, loving family experience of each other wouldn't you say yeah yeah it's beautiful yeah so i i was um was reading the other day samuel rutherford and he said (laughs) samuel rutherford's in prison when he's writing and he says in fellowship this prison is a palace (laughs) he he he's got this strange ability to feel and sense and enjoy and drink and eat of christ even in the worst of circumstances. Or Madame Guyon said when she was put in prison, she goes, I, man, bro, this moves me. She said, I prayed until every stone in my cell shone like a ruby. <laughs> there's wow. a, there's a, there's an, a, a blissful enjoyment of God that lifts man above the earth. He, it takes him out of the need for the, the lower things and satisfies him with the highest things, which is Christ and his excellencies. <laughs> you agree? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. We see this with John as well. I mean, this is a guy who was boiled in hot oil. He was banned to an island and he's having revelation of Christ. He's writing these things not as some, you know, 22 year old been saved for six months and is really in his honeymoon period and loves fellowship with God and wants everybody to experience it. This is distilled over 60 years of walking with God. He's 90 at this time. This is potent spiritual liquor. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, <laughs> been, it's been sitting for a long time and it's smooth enough to bring a deep intoxication from the spirit, which is this. I have been with him I have seen him, I have touched him, and I do today, and I'm telling you these things so that you can have this that I have with him. I love it. Yeah, it's amazing, man. (laughs) It's beautiful. So he goes on here and he says, oh, you know what's interesting? It just came up in my mind. In John 16, 
he tells us that Jesus concludes his spiritual discourse, 14, 15, 16, with these words, I tell you these things so that your joy may be full. He's the one that reminds us that the conclusion of Christ's teaching is to remove every obstruction to having all joy in him. And here right. we see, again, he says the, the same thing. I'm, I want to remove all the obstructions so that you can find Christ in, in, in that complete joy. This is the message we have heard from him. Oh, I really want to hear your thoughts on this. This is the message that we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. Talk to me. Yeah, so it's interesting how he, how he opens his letter. He first opens the letter by speaking of the Christ and an experiential encounter with the Christ, right? The Christ is meant to be experienced. And fellowship is unto ultimate joy, nothing that the world can offer. And what was planned from before the foundations of the earth in the heart of the Father, so after talking about the Christ and presenting the Christ or re-presenting the Christ to them, he, he now connects that to message, which is so important. It's so important. We cannot divorce Christ from his message or Christ from his gospel. Christ is the revealed word of God and his message is the word speaks, right? The word <laughs> speaks words. And so it's, it's, it's always beautiful how John summarizes things. Right, how he has a he has a knack for just summarizing things. The message we have heard from him, we proclaim to you: God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. God is holy. Hmm. God is holy. That which the seraphs, the living creatures, are constantly proclaiming as they behold Him, as they do verse one, right? As, as, as they're from the very foundation and be, their very beginning, they do verse one, first John one, one, <laughs> they proclaim verse five, <laughs> right? Right. Right. That's all they're proclaiming, <laughs> right? There is none like him. He is absolute light. <laughs> and what would be the opposite to that is darkness. In him, there is no darkness, no darkness at all. So he's, he's definitely giving like a, 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 recall, a recalling back to mind the separation that God gives between day and night, between mm -hmm. darkness and light. There's separation. Yeah. The two cannot be mixed. God is holy. God is light. Darkness is on the outside. Darkness is in this fallen world. In him, there's no darkness at all. Wow. Do you think there's something to... Uh, the the actual element, I mean, there is, you just said, but do you think there's something more to the imagery of light? For instance, my room here has a window and light from the sun gives itself freely to everybody, everywhere. The only place it doesn't hit is where there's an obstruction. So if I open the curtains of my window, light comes in to the degree it's not obstructed. If I close the curtain halfway, the light will come in to the degree it's not obstructed. Do you think that there's an element to God's nature and character that is seen in the dispensing of light from the sun on the earth where God gives himself to whoever will remove the obstacles to receiving him? That's that. Yeah, yeah very well put. And it's something he talks about in the Gospels as well, where he talks about sun and rain and God's nature being good his goodness is wanting to give himself to his creation not just the blessings of the godhead but the very person which is the highest blessing the chief blessing of all mm -hmm. and he causes his son to shine his rain to fall on all we see the we see it in the parable of the seed where the seed is the word of god of the parable of the sower the seed is the word of god the word of god which we know to be the very person jesus is the word of god that's what john is talking about the communion and communication of the father and uh indiscriminately scattered to all mm -hmm. but what stops him from being received of course are the obstructions whether it's of hardness of heart yeah. or the thorns that we or human, whoever maybe humanity refuses to deal with, 
It's, yeah. it's the obstructions that humanity has set in their own hearts. Wow. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a great observation. Yeah. I read in Luke yesterday, Jesus says of his father, he himself is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. <laughs> that is crazy. God is still kind to those people that are ungrateful. And even as you said, he showers his rain on the just and, and the unjust. God is light in him. There's no darkness at all. And here he comes with a application to the stark contrast between the dividing of light and darkness. If we say that is interesting because it's as if he knows something about the people he's writing to. There's people that are pr professing something. So he says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. I think he's actually explaining to us that many people will say, I know God. I walk with God. I have an experience with God. I have a uh, relationship with God. But he's saying it doesn't matter what they profess with their mouth. If their life is outside of the likeness to God, then they are liars. They are lying and they do not, they do not practice the truth. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I think he's, he's saying fellowship with him will make you holy, will make you like he is, <laughs> right? We're being conformed into the same image as we behold, Paul says in 2 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 4, from one degree of glory to another degree of the glory. It's as we behold, as we're doing First John verse 1, we ourselves are being transformed to that very same image. <laughs> so the message that we have heard is that God is holy, mm -hmm. right? There's a separation between God and mm God. -hmm and darkness th this world of sin this world that is being governed by the prince of darkness and if we truly fellowship with him we ourselves will increasingly come more so into the very experience and partaking of that same nature yeah. of holiness and to live in light is to practice truth it's interesting that he says that um if, if we say we have fellowship with him yeah. right they, they lie and do not practice, practice. the truth so then Mm -hmm. The practical or, or, or the picture that it gives for growing in holiness through fellowship with God is the practice of truth. <laughs> That's great. The practice of truth. Do you think that that, oh, well, he goes on, I guess, to explain even more further about what a Christian does with sin and how he deals with sin? Because I was going to ask you, Light and darkness are pretty, I mean, they're completely different. So how can a person walk in the light and yet have issues in their heart that God is dealing with or things that they're growing in or, you know what I'm saying? Uh, sure. Yeah. You think yeah. it goes on to explain that? I think, I think it goes on to explain that uh, in, in the next few verses and then even the next chapter. But one thing I'll say is... And I think it's relevant to contemporary culture today is that I know there's a lot of talk about like my truth or your <laughs> truth. You know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. I may experience something or I may have experienced something in my life. Maybe it's something that's been a negative experience in my life or a positive experience, whatever it may be. But ultimately I now have the ability to say that this is truth to me. And so therefore this is truth. And, you know, we hear these terms like, you know, if that's your truth, you know, if, if a man wants to consider himself, for example, like a woman, you know, a man wants to say, I want to identify as a woman because to me, that's my truth. That's still not the truth. It's not the truth. There is the truth. And so uh, or on so many different levels, I think that we, you know, humanity has always found from the beginning of time a way to try to usurp the throne of God and to, and to redefine what is true based upon our comforts and our preferences. And it's the practice of God's truth. Hmm. It's interesting because Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, when she starts to, she encounters the Lord and she now knows that she's encountering the divine and immediately her heart, you know, sometimes when you're in the, you know, Peter's in the presence of God, on the mountain 
and he beholds the glory of God in the person of Christ. And he's like, uh, we should build three tabernacles. You know what I mean? Like whatever's in his heart, you know, just kind of comes out. Uh, he has a revelation of the Christ and is like, no, 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 you can't suffer. You know, here's this woman. She's encountering the, the, the Lord, the Messiah. And she says, our fathers say that it's on this mountain. The Jews say it's on this mountain. Which mountain is it? You know, like she wants to deviate the conversation to, to, to religion. And he says, it is no longer on this mountain or that mountain. He says, but the time is now. The time has come. The time is now. My father seeks those that worship in spirit and in truth. And so to me, the, the, what would be opposite to spirit and truth is flesh and lie. So it's not in the power of our flesh. God is not looking for worship based upon, you know, us just getting, you know, screaming loud enough or trying hard enough. It's not by, it's not by our strength or by our flesh. And it's not based upon our version of truth. He's looking for worshipers who worship the revelation of him based upon his definition mm -hmm. and by the spirit that he supplies. Yeah. That's why the Bible's so important, isn't it? It's so very can, important. Yeah, yeah. So we can well see, said. <laughs> so we can well see said. his self his self revelation. I, I think you defined faith from one time for me as a uh, uh putting your trust in God's self revelation or how he's revealed himself, which is a fantastic because people have redefined God, redefined love, redefined truth. But that's why the scriptures are an anchor to our, to our souls. You know, as Charles Spurgeon said, whether you need the sword of offense or the shield of defense, it's all found in the blessed word of inspiration. Adolf Safer said, the Bible is among books what Christ is amongst men. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and, and a quote from Andrew Murray about fellowship and light, he says, sin is powerless in fellowship with God. And I guess if, if there's a, somebody watching this right now and you've been struggling with sin, let me say this Andrew Murray quote to you in context of this chapter and just break that off you. Sin is powerless in fellowship with God. Just abide in his presence, consistently walk in, in, in him, in, that, in the light, and the Lord will keep you uh, from sin. And even if failure comes in some way, he will, he will wash you. For it goes on to say here, it says, uh, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. I, I heard Zach Poonin the other day, one of my favorite teachers from India, he said, the Bible does not just say the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. It says that that promise is tied together with those who walk in fellowship. He says, that's very good. He said, nobody can just say, yeah, well, Jesus is sin. Or Jesus, his blood washes my sin. That doesn't apply to anybody, but those who walk in fellowship with God. I, I know, and I've met different people. You probably have as well. People that have claimed to be clean from sin or that they're, you know, they're walking right, but they don't walk in fellowship with God. You, you say, how do I know if I'm walking in fellowship with God? Well, number one, I think above all things, is the recognition of who Christ is and your trust placed in him and expressed in a daily, a daily exchange with him. Uh, how would you say someone can know that they're walking in fellowship with God? Yeah. The, the, all, besides what you said, the other part that I'll bring up, which he highlights quite a bit in the rest of the, in his letter, the rest of his letter is, he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, so we're walking in fellowship with him. He says, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. And so I think there's, it's, it's something about, the revelation of the Godhead that is the standard for all things. We see father, son, and spirit engaged in beautiful union. Uh, when we walk in the light, it, it does something to us. It, it brings us into authentic relationship with others, mm -hmm. authentic relationship with others. And so uh, practically speaking, I think it looks like verse one. It looks like <laughs> um, hearing him, mm -hmm. seeing him, looking upon him, touching him, yeah. communing with him. And then the way that that plays out is hmm. that which we have seen, we proclaim to you, yeah. right? That, that, that same, uh, 
reality, that same presence that he pours out into our own hearts now mm-hmm. spills over yes. to those that are around us. And that is the evidence that we are walking as saints who've been washed by his blood and are constantly, because the, the truth of the matter is this, we continuously need forgiveness. I think sometimes people believe that because we pray a prayer when we first get born again, we're forgiven and, and we never need forgiveness again. But, but repentance is really a way of life, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. we've been forgiven. We are saved. We are born again. We are sons and daughters. We don't need to pray or repent to become sons and daughters again or to be, to be saved again. We're born again. But we constantly need to be washed. Mm-hmm. And that happens through fellowship with him and walking in the light with others. Uh, John Owen wrote in his book, Glory of Christ, he said, if heaven was full of believers who never sinned, then they'd be empty. <laughs> Basically, from here on out, we think many times that we're going to reach a place of perfection in which we no longer need the Lord, in, in a sense. Because to say you don't need forgiveness is, in a sense, to say you no longer need the Lord. Um, so he says here, if we confess our sins, oh, wait, wait, we have to hit eight. If we say we have no sin, if we say we have no sin, there must have been people that John knew about that were proclaiming something similar to what you just said. I don't, I don't need forgiveness anymore. Look at me. I'm, you know, I'm doing good. I'm not doing the things that I used to do. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And it's important to realize too, that self-deception is something that's real. Right. It's, this is why I think brothers are needed in each other's lives because when you're self-deceived, you don't know that you're deceived. <laughs> You've deceived yourself. Yeah. yeah, by definition, right. Yeah. If you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. Right? You don't know. But and if, and if it's a deception that you yourself have convinced yourself of, I mean, you and I have, have met people in recently, in recent years, some people that we know of have slipped into self-deceptions where they themselves convinced themselves of something and it changed the way that they acted. And then brothers had to call it out and then based upon how the response comes determines how god can deal with them from there but self-deception is a real thing and sometimes that self-deception can be about ourselves man it's crazy jesus says take out the log in your eye before taking out the speck in another's it's it's almost like the variation in size of a speck in a log is how much more your issue with christ is important to him than you recognizing other people's issues with him. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's so important. So if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth, again, the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yeah. So here's a question. Why do you believe in the economy of God, right? In, in God's ways of relating to humanity. We, we see his solution for sin is the offering of the blood of his son. Why is it that confessing our sins is the means by which we are forgiven? Confession of sin. So it's, it's, yeah. it's in essence, me agreeing with what God's diagnosis is about my current condition and me saying it back to God. Yeah. I mean, just cause it could be, it could have been like any, any other way, but it's, it's, it, it's confession. Of course we know confession, at least to repentance in this context, it's assumed that you're confessing because your heart is repentant. I think it's just the same way. And this is a terrible analogy. It's the same reason why a guy taps out in a fight. You know, he's like, I give up. Uh, I'm not going to resist you anymore. I'm done. You know, I, I realize the weight of, upon me is too heavy for me to bear. And I give up. I recognize that I can't beat you. I can't defeat you. You are greater than I. You are the supreme one and I am not. And I humble myself before you and speak out to you. It's almost like the same way when you were, when you beat a guy in basketball, you're like, okay, tell me who won, who won, you or me. <laughs> right, I want to say right. it one more time. Did I win? Yeah. Say, what, I want you to tell everybody else who won. <laughs> you know, it's obviously these are terrible analogies, but you there? Whoa. Yeah. 
Yeah. Iraq, Iraq happens. Huh? Iraq. Yeah. Uh, but these are terrible analogies. But in a sense, what I'm saying is, I think it's humility. It's saying, oh, Lord, I am. I am, as Jesus says, I have no life in myself. And I realize that. So I cast myself upon you and your blood and in a reconfession of, of who you are and what you've done for me. Uh, what, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think it's agreement. I think it's agreement because the Lord is, is looking for man's agreement. He's looking for, can two walk together unless they're in mm-hmm. agreement? You know, he's looking for our agreement. And when we confess our sins, we're speaking the truth back to God. You know, those that practice the truth, those that deceive themselves, in essence, it says the truth is not in them. In essence, they squeeze out. There's no room for the truth, like you were mentioning, or even the parable of the sower. There's no room for the seed, which is the word of God, which is truth, the word of life in their hearts. And so he's looking for those, I believe, that are that are willing to agree with him mm-hmm. and willing to side with truth, <laughs> uh, which ultimately issues forth from God and not from this world. Yeah. This world cannot redefine what is truth. And I think that's so important. I know we touched on it briefly, especially in our generation right now, you know, and even as we're, as we're, I believe, really nearing the Lord's return for us to stand for truth in a world that is constantly seeking to distort truth and redefine truth and influence us to believe lie. Hmm. Um, Yeah. It's interesting how he says too, Jesus will be faithful. If we come in agreement and confess the truth, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He will be faithful to forgive us of our sins, but not just to forgive us of our sins, but to cleanse us from the stain of sin. Mm. And it's it's one thing to, and that's the danger of sin. It's it's not just that we, mm. as if it's not bad enough, as if it's not bad enough. It's not just that we grieve the heart of God, mm-hmm. but we and 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 hurt others, mm-hmm. right? Because when we sin, we hurt God, we hurt others. But it's also the impact that it has on our own soul, the way yeah. it numbs us to the person of God, to the voice of God. Yeah. It's, it's sin has a way of staining us with unrighteousness. But when, when we confess our sins, when we're, the, when we're willing to come in agreement with the truth and with him who is truth, he will not just forgive us of the, and the influence and the impact that it's had mm-hmm. upon our psyche. That's a that's a yeah. a beautiful thing because the most dangerous part about sin is what it does to the well. Let me take that back. I can't say this is the most dangerous part. I think it's the most underrated or most overlooked part about sin. Let me say that. The, I think often the most overlooked part about sin, besides how it impacts the heart of God, yeah. is what it does to us. Huh. The imprint it leaves upon us, so that even when we we may be forgiven. It, 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 it numbs the heart. But if we come into agreement with truth, we're cleansed of that unrighteousness. Man, it, it's crazy that it says he's faithful. <laughs> that is just incredible to me. And based on his righteousness, faithful and righteous, it, it's the re-imputing, in a sense, it's the re-imputation or imputing of righteousness again. Okay, let me give you my garments. You know, let, let me again give to you, not that, you know, ultimately we have a righteousness that is, doesn't fade away. That is Christ. Sure. But in, in the acting outside of that, he pulls you back underneath its reality again, faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love that because it's not just the thing you're asking for forgiveness for. It's everything that's connected to it. The whole motive and intention behind it, the the poison of the whole is washed away. And I think in answer to your question too, is in verse 10, when you said, uh, why is it that God asks for confession? Verse 10 says, if we say we have not sinned, that's not confessing, right? <laughs> so sure. We, we, make, <laughs> we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So if a man refuses to confess, he attacks God's character and his word. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. That's really good. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. I would add to that too. It's the rejection of poverty of spirit. Yeah. So when, when yes. Jesus calls his disciples up to the mountain, right, he's taking that seat of a lawgiver and king. 
The Messiah is God in the flesh. And he begins to unveil for them in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the, 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 if we could say like the constitution or the foundations of the kingdom of God. And he begins with joyful, right? Happy, right? I'm writing these things to you so that your joy may be complete. John says, we write unto this end the chief goal that we would come into the fullness of joy, right? That's why we're, we're sharing these things with you. Jesus begins the foundations of God's, the kingdom's constitution with saying, how joyful are those who are, who, who the poor in spirit, poverty of spirit, the recognition that we are bankrupt before God and we need grace and life and light and love, right? To proceed forth from him to bring us back, you know, to himself and so that we can live as kingdom people, citizens of the kingdom. And then he goes on to there uh, from there. Happy, joyful are those who mourn, <laughs> right? The bankruptcy of spirit leads us to, to mourn of our condition. We enter into meekness. And, and as we enter into meekness, we hunger and thirst for that righteousness so that we can come into purity to see God. Mm. Right. But it's, I think it's, I think verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. It's, it's, the, the heart's refusal to come into the joy that identifies mm. with poverty of spirit. God, I need you, right? What, what was that, the, the, the church that Jesus uh, writes that says, we need nothing. Yeah, Laodicea. Right, we, we need nothing. He says, but I say to you, you are poor, you are <laughs> naked, and you are blind, right? Yes. Come buy from me. Um, yeah, it's interesting. And I really believe in many ways. What would you say about this? I believe it's safe to say, at least from his book, I know he's going to talk about the devil later on. He talks about the devil. But I believe it's safe to say sin is the chief enemy of the believer. Now, I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear, you know, your thoughts on that. The reason I say that is because the devil can only exploit what the flesh makes room for. <laughs> and, and the devil is not, I, I don't, now maybe I'm wrong, but I don't, I don't feel like the, de you know, the devil certainly prowls around looking for an opportunity to exploit. But it's, it's the habits that people have formed or it's the lies that we have chosen to believe or it's often I feel like we, you know, humans or even believers do enough of a job digging holes for ourselves that the devil's busy somewhere else doing something else. You know what I mean? So it seems like he's dealing, it seems like he's chiefly here dealing with sin. Mm -hmm. And then he later on goes to talk about the influence uh, in the world of the devil. Now, and obviously sin comes from the devil so I'm not trying to separate those two, but uh, what, what would you say to that? I would agree 100% with the statement and I would actually look in and take a magnifying glass to it. The statement, which you just said, which is sin is the ultimate enemy of the believer. I would put a magnifying glass to it. And I think in the nucleus of it, you'd see pride. If you look at the, the prophets, if anybody was to read through the prophets, you see Christ has an issue with the earth. God has an issue with the earth and it's the pride of man, the haughtiness of man. He comes to lay low the proud. So I feel like, yes, the, the statement is 100% true and it's nucleus heart. The yoke of sin is man's pride, his raising up of himself above God in a sense. And it has all these offshoots as we've talked about personally before fruits and root that right. sin itself is is pride in and of itself and sins are the offshoots the expressions of that root which is sin itself jesus came to strike the root of sin as the antidote for your sins it's like a man can cut his grass over and over again but until the root be ripped out He's going to keep having to pull them up. I mean, he's going to have to keep mowing the grass. And, and so I feel like, yes, what you're saying is 100% true. And that's why I believe the gospel calls for a man to humble himself before God and recognize. I remember reading Rutherford said that, um, he, he said that a, a man is not proud for clinging to a rock in a river. 
Like if the river's taking him and he grabs onto the rock to save his life, he can't take any credit for it. He's casting himself upon the rock. And salvation is a cry for mankind to realize you have offended God. You have directly fought against him. You've shot your arrows at him. You've lifted your nose against him. You've turned your back on him. And yet he has come with humility to take your place. And you must recognize that and say, oh, my, here's my response. I give up. I give myself over to you. I put my, my trust and my faith in you. I'm not the Lord of my life. You are. That's the expression of true humility, right? And so, yes, I would agree completely with the statement. And I see even in this book that we're reading, the, the, the root of love and life and light has got to be the exaltation of Christ, which is the dethronement of self and the enthronement of God, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm reminded as well, uh, when Jesus uh, gives a story, he shares a parable about two, you know, there's, there's a, a person in the temple beating his chest, telling the Lord, Lord, I'm not worthy. Um, have mercy on a sinner like me. And then there's the, the self-righteous, you know, the picture of the, of the Pharisee who starts to talk about Right. We talk about at, the, at, at a heart level, they're both <laughs> looking for forgiveness, right? Or should be looking for forgiveness. But one of them is exalting what himself. Mm -hmm. So he cannot find forgiveness from sin because the ultimate expression of sin is what? The exaltation of his own self. <laughs> it's, it's really all about him. He says, I've, you know, I fast this many times and I do this and I do that and I give and, and thank God I'm not like, like these other ones. And so, we, we see this picture, I believe, in the Gospels and in, in the New Covenant where the heart of a saint looks like that, that one beating his chest saying, I'm not worthy. Mm -hmm. But then that person is in, empowered by the grace of God to live free from the sins, like you mentioned, right? The mm -hmm. sins that source out of a heart that is fixated on itself rather than God. It's, it's neither, it's neither uh, one or the other, meaning like it's, it's yeah. not the guy who beats his chest, but it's still living in darkness. Yeah. Or it's not the one who's not living in darkness, but is not beating his chest, recognizing his need for God. It's the person who recognizes his need for God, who is able to live righteous. Which, and, and we know that it comes through fellowship. And yeah, which in essence, I, I think is summed up in John, his gospel, when he says, and as many as received him, he gave the right to be sons of God. The receiving of Christ means the renunciation of self because you can't hold two things at once. Either he's there in the hope, in the heart or you're there. You know, to receive Christ is to say, you are who you say you are and you must be who you are to me. Right? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's great. That's yeah. amazing. Man. So I would, I would sum up the whole first chapter in my opinion. And maybe you can do a summary too, and then we'll just pray. I would sum up the whole first chapter with this. God wants to fellowship with every person watching this video. His goal is to make your joy complete by removing every obstacle and shining like light upon your life and being the fulfillment and satisfaction of your soul himself. If you will just enter into fellowship with him through faith in Christ again and again and again, living in that place, how would you define the, or summarize? Yeah, I don't know if I could do it better than that. Yes. I, think the only, I think the only thing I would add to that is, and he's looking for your agreement. He's, yes. he's looking for the agreement of your heart to, to, to say yes to who he's revealed himself to be, to say yes to the message of the gospel as he's revealed it through his word to say yes about what he says about your current condition mm. and the, the invitation yeah. to bring you to himself, whatever you may be facing today, right? It's, it's whatever you may be facing or whatever you're going through. Mm -hmm. If in your heart, you will give Christ your agreement. Um, he will come, he will, he will wash. He will bring you into the light. Yeah. They'll walk together, right? Cause how to walk together unless they agree. The, the agreement is an abiding, abiding and abiding in his presence. Are you there? 
Yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> the internet here. <laughs> no, it's fine. You want to pray, and then uh, then we'll just uh, say goodbye to the people. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the word of God. You are the light of God, the life of God. You embody the love of God. Lord, for all those watching today, Lord, we, we ask you that you would bring them into the experience of you as light and life and love. And if there's any impediments at all, mm -hmm. any obstructions, as Eric mentioned at all, in the heart, in the mind, any lies that any, any may have believed or the, or the, uh, any permission that we've given to lies to touch our lives, to stain our lives, to stain our minds. God, I ask you now to touch the hearts and minds and bodies of all those listening, even right now. Lord, bring us into forgiveness and into cleansing so that we may have fellowship with you. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Man, thanks guys so much for watching. I'm going to uh, put Dave's link underneath the video if you want to help his missions organization in, in Iraq. Uh, it's kgmiq.org, but I'm going to put a link down below if you want to help them out. Love you guys and stay tuned for John, 1 John chapter 2. Blessings.